uh, we're happy to welcome Lucas Reiter, who um, uh, used to be, be a former PhD student in our group uh, many years ago. So some of the tools you heard about, MProfit and, and Mayu, that we discussed during the week, uh, Lucas was uh, 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 very involved in developing these. He's now part of a small company, Biognosis, in the, in the Zurich area, which is very focused on targeted proteomics. And he's going to tell us something about how to do because we've talked mainly about DAA from, from the kind of uh, QTOF perspective, uh, Lucas is going to say something about doing DAA on an orbit trap and, and also their software platform called Spectronaut. Thanks, okay. Thank you very much, Ben, and thanks for inviting me here. Hello, everybody. Um, I am going to um, talk about uh, data independent acquisition on orbit trap analyzers. And just as an introduction, very often um, what you would like to do is you have some experimental setup, you have some conditions. A number of very nice experimental setups have been described by Rudy before. And what we then would like to do is we would like to profile proteomes, whole proteomes. And very simplified, this could maybe look like this. Uh, you have healthy individuals, you have uh, sick individuals, and um, you want to see how the, how the proteome behaves or how individual proteins behave. And so I'm going to talk about this from a more from a from a perspective of a company and what our com what our customers really uh, want to know from us and what they what kind of experiments they want to do. And very often they they want to have molecular insight into biological processes, or they want to do comparison or clustering of prototypes. Very similar, also basically what Rudy has presented before. Or they want to do classical biomarker discovery. That's also very popular. So you would just like to know what. You would like to know proteins or combinations of proteins that are that can predict a certain state of, of some biological system. And in terms of samples, what we measure very often is uh, blood, most, mostly from humans, but also from animals sometimes, uh, urine, cerebral spinal fluid, tissue. Uh, so Often customers also have model systems, cell lines, or also extracellular matrices. The number of different samples we measure, measure is actually quite uh, is, is astonishingly diverse, I would say. In terms of samples and experiment size, these can be rather small uh, experiments, for instance, uh, six samples, but it can also be very large experiments, hundreds of samples, and we would actually like to go more into the direction of very large experiments because the technology allows to do this, and you can draw very interesting conclu conclusion from such kind of data if the quality is high enough. And in terms of conditions, so for the experimental setup, it's very no big surprises there. So disease states, drug treatment, time courses, these are the kind of experiments we, we are analyzing. And in terms of technology, very globally, there are label-based technologies, there are label-free uh, technologies. I'm going to talk only about label-free technologies today. And for the start, I want to give you a quick comparison. I guess most of you know how shotgun proteomics works, but I'm just going to quickly explain it here on this slide. So what is done in... Um, I will quickly take the pointer here. So what is usually done is a, a MS1 survey scan. So this is a, a scan of the intact peptides, and the mass spectrometer decides which ones are the most intense ones. It's going to frag, uh, select them specifically, fragment them, and this is then going to be used to identify them. And if you compare this to data independent acquisition, uh, you also can do an MS1 service scan. It's optional, but it's a good thing to do it. Uh, and then in data independent acquisition, what you do is you broaden the selection windows to fragment your precursors. And you do this in a very regular manner. So you, and you have then these um, connected segments uh, where you fragment your precursors one after another, and the pattern looks in like here on the right. It's a very regular pattern. Um, and it's also, you could say, a very simple method, because the acquisition is definitely simpler than for shotgun proteomics. Uh, on this slide, I would like to give you a little um, like the development of the field of data independent acquisition and also how we relate to this, uh, for those who don't know us. Um, so you could, or I divided here the development of data independent acquisition into two segments. The first one was uh, when there were methods published, but the data analysis was largely very similar to, to shotgun, how shotgun data was analyzed. So the, uh, these people, they basically, m you could say, misused shotgun search engines to analyze data independent acquisition data. And then I divided it into the second part, where novel uh, analysis methodologies were developed and also novel acquisition methods were developed and there was new dynamic in the field of data independent acquisition. Uh, the 
The term data independent acquisition was termed in 2004 by Venable et al. Uh, in 2006, Waters published his MSE approach. It's also a data independent uh, approach. Um, in 2008, Bagnosis was founded, and this was also the time uh, where in the laboratory of Rudy uh, the SWOF technology was developed. Then in 2011, we went to Bremen and we made the first measurements on a, on a new instrument, a QX Active, so a quadrupole Orbitrap instrument. And we also uh, we were interested that you could do this uh, SWOF type of analysis also on an Orbitrap because there was a quadrupole in the front, now you could also do such analysis on this instrument, or you could do it better, let's say. And we also, during this time, we de developed our software. I'm going to say more about this. Uh, the software is called Spectronaut. Then um, it took quite a bit to get this paper published, but in 2012, the, the Schiele et al. Swoff paper was published. In 2012, we published this IRT concept. Back then, we mo it was published for MRM, but it was clear that you could also it was clear back then that you could also transfer this to, to the more high content method, data independent acquisition. Then in 2012, we made the, the Spectron software public and, and then there were additional acquisition methods developed. The field was, was, very, uh, was developing rapidly for this method from Egerton et al. And then there was also a new uh, anal analysis method published just recen recently, which is very interesting, the IA umpire. There are, of course, lots of other, other uh, things that were developed that didn't have space on this slide here. Um, and for the first part, so these this early publications, I, I listed these. They are basically in this. They are also listed in the, in the SWOF publication from, Schiele, from Ludovic. And uh, what they basically did is, they, as I said, they used modified database search engines. Uh, the MSE approach of Waters, they also used a search engine, but they did the data pre-processing a little bit different, and they also used drift time instead of segmenting by M or a set, uh, uh, the precursors. And what, what was also done uh, was, uh, because these instruments were not really able to produce high quality data if you were doing a single shot of your sample, they were also doing a lot of gas phase fractionation. So you would take the same sample and you would look at different segments in precursor space and shoot your sample several times to get a higher quality of the data. And uh, so then basically there was this uh, paper of Ludovic and this was a completely new way of analyzing uh, th this type of data, and it, it's called targeted analysis uh, using spectral libraries. And what it basically means is that you, you have a library of uh, spectra or assays, and you take these to generate extracted ion currents from your data. You can do this on both levels, MS1 and MS2. And if you graphically visualize this, so this would be a, a, an MS2 spectrum, convoluted, many precursors are fragmented in this spectrum. And you can go and look for a specific fragment ions in this spectrum. Uh, you can do this over time. And then if you look at the data from a different angle, so if you look at it from the retention time uh, perspective or retention time domain, the data looks actually very similar to, um, to MRM data. And so as, as we were also at the time working on this AMP of the approach and we were developing statistical tools, how you can analyze uh, more high throughput MRM data, we thought, yeah, this will certainly also suit to analyze this type of uh, DIA data. Um, so this is then where this MPROF algorithm jumped in and where, we where one could show that you can also use this algorithm to analyze this more uh, high content uh, data. Okay, so there's also, if you compare shotgun to uh, data independent acquisition, there's another interesting angle of view, so if you look at a typical shotgun method, there is roughly 25% of the time spent on acquiring MS1 scans, and the MS1 scans are the ones that are later on used to uh, quantify. Uh, when you look at a typical data independent acquisition method, maybe 90% of the time the mass spectrometer spends on acquiring MS2 scans, and these are the ones that are then usually used for quantitation. So you can see that the mass spectrometer is spending more time in acqu on acquiring scans that are used for quantitation, which, which is certainly not a bad thing. Uh, there is also a another interesting uh, perspective. There was also a paper from the McCoss lab about this. So in Shotgun, you, are, you have in the data analysis, you have basically the spectrum view. view. So you are looping through the spectrum and you're trying to, to identify 
which peptide corresponds to this or was basically measured in this spectrum. And in, in the targeted analysis of the the IA data, this whole paradigm is flipped over. So you start with your spectral library and you look into your spectra with your spectral library and you are asking, can I see these peptides in the, in the data? And so in terms of instrumentation, I wanted to, because uh, I'm, I'm talking about Orbitrap instrumentation, but you can do this on various different types of instrumentations. I have a slide about this. So typically you want to, de to divide your precursor space into swaths. And you can do this uh, by different means. So you can do it by drift time, for instance. This is done on the silent instruments of Waters and was published with this MSE approach. You can, it's um, most often done by M Rosette. And this can be done very well with a quadrupole. So if your instrument has a quadrupole, then uh, it can basically segment your precursor according to M Rosette. Uh, then a high, having high resolution is very crucial because your spectra are very complex and the high resolution helps to uh, deconvolute this complexity again. And high resolution uh, analyzers are definitely TOF and Orbitrap analyzers. Uh, you also need a high-end instrumentation. I was talking about before that people were doing gas phase fractionation because the data was simply too complex. Um, so if you, uh, you need a high-end high instrumentation, to perform single shot analysis of complex uh, samples and to be able to analyze the data afterwards. Um, you also need to, in your method, you need to balance the number of swaths and the resolution and the complexity. So, of course, the field was in the recent years trying to, to develop efficient methods. Once, this, once the field will, have, will reach a state where everyone thinks that they know how an efficient method will look like, I hope that this will rather go to the background and just you can take an efficient method and you don't have to worry about it and it will just generate nice data. Um, and examples of instrumentations are triple TOF instruments, Thermo, Q, Orbitrap, as quadrupole Orbitrap instruments, Water Synapse, Bruco, Impact2. So there's, um, there's no limit in the instrumentation uh, nowadays that can perform this type of analysis. Um, spectral library generation, a few words. So typically this is done by shotgun proteomics. So that's a, definitely a, the best suited method to generate spectral libraries or to, to make an inventory of your sample to say these are all the proteins and can measure in this sample. And then if you would talk a bit more technically about what is really required in a spectral library, is basically the precursor M over set and the fragment M over set. And our software can even work with this type of data, so you could just feed it the precursor M over sets and the fragment M over sets, and it would work. But it helps if you have more additional information. Um, so it's really highly recommended to have some sort of normalized retention time in your spectral library. And there's also really no reason not to do this, because when you perform shotgun and you, um, you generate your spectral library, it's just a matter of setting the exper experiment up correctly and to do the analysis correctly, and you can calculate normalized retention time. So it's, and it has a huge advantage for data analysis, so I really highly recommend to, to do this all the time, because there's no reason not to do it. Um, then, of course, relative fragment ion intensities uh, also highly recommended. They just help in, in uh, getting a better confidence in identification and better data quality in the end. And optional, you can also have meta information, of course, like the peptide sequence and so forth. So uh, a really uh, complete spectral library will contain all of this information. <clears throat> and then here on the right is just a picture shown um, when you repeatedly inject the same sample, when you correct for the protein FDR with growing data set size, uh, you can see a certain uh, growth and a certain saturation. And this was also for a long time, or even now still, the mostly used way how we generate spectral libraries. So we just uh, we shoot a sample to saturation, for, in for instance, six times. This spectral library is then usually bigger than if you would shoot your sample just single uh, time, uh, significantly bigger, actually, and then you can use the spectral library to an analyze your sample. Um, so then we were, of course, it uh, is also the there was the question, should I fractionate to generate my spectral library or should I not? There is advantages and disadvantages related to that. And here we made a small experiment on our QX active um, and a UHPLC, two-hour gradient, and a HeLa sample, which we usually take for such small experiments, uh, this sample. 
And uh, so we shoot the sample in six technical replicates, and we, we generated high, PA, high pH reverse phase fractions, also six of them, and we measured them on, uh, on our instrument. Of course, it's the same time the instrument spends on generating the spectral library. And here you can see the size of the spectral libraries. Interestingly, the ratio of proteins to precursors changes, probably because our instrument was a little bit over-occupied uh, because it's not the Q executive, it's not the newest generation of instruments anymore, so it's not the fastest of in instruments you can have. Uh, so you, one can say um, identical instrument time for both uh, spectral libraries, and uh, the spectral library with the, frac uh, the fractionation is larger, like, like you would expect. And when you then apply this to single shot DIA runs, also two hours, these were the results we got. And we looked at some different criteria, the number of identifications was higher when we used uh, the one uh, from uh, resulting from fractionation. Not extremely much, but it was still uh, maybe a 10% improvement. Then you can use look at reproducibility. That's also something very important. We want to our data to be reproducible and to have very few missing values in there. And the reproducibility was roughly similar between the two spectral libraries. And the CVs, like you would expect, they were almost identical. I would actually expect that that's the case, especially on peptide level, maybe not on protein level. So we concluded, yeah, uh, if you do fractionation, this is, of course, a really mild fractionation. It's not uh, 100 fractions. Um, then the spectral library performed a little bit better. Still doesn't mean that we will now regularly do this, just because we have to, we want to limit the uh, amount of time we spend in the laboratory, of course. And um, yeah, so there's an overhead in sample prep fractionation. So um, that was just a small study we did. Of course, you could do this a bit more extensively and yeah. So then, uh, this was in the very, very beginning when we started um, acquiring data, independent acquisition data, we were interested in how is the performance as compared to Shotgun. And this we published last year. So the setup was the following. We, uh, we took a complex background because this is what we mostly measure. So we took a HEC-293 cell line lysate. Um, we generated eight samples and we spiked in 11 pure proteins with known, amount, known absolute amounts in these eight samples. And then we performed 24 DDA runs, so always three replicates and 24 DIA runs. And we also had a special uh, acquisition schema here on the right, which we generated with the help of Olga Vitek to make it a fair comparison in the end. And so this was basically block randomization. Um, here on the lower left, you can see the, the spike-in schemas we used. I'm not going into this now here. So for the, for the spike-in proteins. And then what we were interested in, the first thing you can look at is the precision of quantitation, meaning for technical replicates, how much does do the signals for the proteins vary. So you would expect that they stay as constant as possible. And if you look at this for MS2 um, and MS1 for shotgun, um, then you can see that the precision of quantitation was better with data independent acquisition. This was al already very promising. <coughs> the next thing we then also looked at was how accurate can we quantify proteins that are differentially regulated across different samples. And this we did with the spiking proteins. I don't have a slide here about that, but we could also see there that data independent acquisition was better in finding regulated proteins Seem to a large extent because it had less missing values and because the data was a bit more precise. And when we looked at the, the reproducibility of quantitation, this is how it looked like um, when we looked at a single run, back then, I must say, we were really surprised by the result, or let's say, back then it was not so clear whether the promise of data independent acquisition would be fulfilled at some point that you can really identify more proteins in a single run as compared to shotgun, because it has just not been shown so clearly back then. Um, but so we were really happy to see that you could actually identify more, more pro proteins and peptides in a single run as compared to shotgun. Uh, but what was even more uh, Interesting was when we looked at how many peptides can be consistently identified across runs, shotgun performed very badly. And when we looked at data independent acquisition, it performed almost perfectly. So we got an almost complete matrix. This matrix this Ru that Rudy showed in his talk um, was almost complete. And if you visualize this here, we just randomly picked 100 precursors for shotgun and DIA and visualize this matrix. On the rows, you would have the peptides, or you can also say the proteins, and on the, on the columns, there would be the runs. And this matrix definitely looks much nicer for data independent acquisition. So what we didn't do in this publication back then was we didn't look at MS1 alignment of shotgun, because we were our position was basically that 
uh, you could also do alignment for data independent acquisition. Of course, when <laughs> back then we didn't know that it would look so great just without any alignment, but uh, yeah, that's, that's another story. But uh, if we would have performed MS1 al alignment back then, um, the data would have maybe looked roughly like this. So it, it would have improved, but not as good as, as the data that was initially generated with data independent acquisition. <coughs> Okay, now I want to say a few things about method design and chromatography. Um, so if you look at, if you would, would look at the signal um, according to the, the dimensions that you have in the data, the retention time in this dimension and the M over Z in this dimension, um, you can imagine that the mass spectrometer makes scans across time and in the scans you have the, the fragment ions across M over Z dimension. And what is very important is that you sample your pre peaks across retention time um, with a reasonable with reasonable data points per peak, um, in classical chemistry, uh, you would usually say that maybe uh, 13 or 15 data points per peak is a good number. When um, and this is definitely true if you don't have to if you don't have to um, counterbalance several para parameters against each other. So if you can just afford to have a high sampling rate, that's definitely a good idea to have 12 to 15 data points per peak. What we found with, uh, with this type of data, it's actually better to sacrifice a little bit on the data points per peak side and go to maybe seven uh, data points per peak. The data quality will still increase just because you are able to reduce the complexity like that. But, um, Okay, so the, it's, uh, you have to balance somehow the peak widths uh, of your chromatography with the method cycle time, that's very important. And other things that you also can balance or other parameters that you can tune, it's the resolutions of the scans on the orbit traps especially, you can do that. And other things you have to consider is the ion flux, because in trap instruments you c there is an optimum number of ions to perform a scan. Uh, with. If you have too many ions, you get uh, space charge effects. If there is too little ions, you don't have such a good signal to noise. So you need a sufficient ion flux that you can always fill the orbit trap in a reasonable amount of time. And this is also something you should consider. Then you can vary the number of precursor segments and of course you can do different numbers of MS1 and MS2 scans. You can do all, uh, all things you want. Of course, uh, also there, it's good to balance the signal to noise of MS1 and MS2 that they're roughly similar. And this is now a bit more visually explained here. So if you would have a peak width of 30 sec seconds, you could say, okay, this is the number of data point points per peak I want. And I can make a dummy method that would look like this. So I would make an MS1 scan and six MS2 scans if I know how, mu how much time these individual scans would take. And then if you have, if in your laboratory the chromatography is maybe uh, UHPLC instead of HPLC and you have smaller peaks, then you can, you can basically design your method according to that or you should design your method according to that. Of course, these are just dummy methods here. So it's a good thing to balance the method with the LC and it's also a good thing to keep the data points per peak constant if you, uh, if you compare methods because otherwise you might draw the wrong conclusions because you actually changed the number of data points per peak and not, it was not some other benefit you had. Uh, and we can also make a little uh, calculation example. Um, so the W would be the full width at half maximum. If you multiply this with 1.7, you will get, will get the peak width at two sigma. And that's also, that's just a typical measure of, of peak width width that makes sense. It's also used for peak capacity calculation, for instance. So you can uh, multiply the full width half maximum with 1.7. And if you, you can then say, I want to have seven data points per peak and just divide it by seven. And this will give you the cycle time that you want to have. And with some reasonable numbers, you would get to a cycle time of maybe 2.5 seconds. That's a very reasonable cycle time to have for, for standard, standard methods, let's say. Um, now we can make this calculation specifically for a Q-executive HF. And um, if, you, if you make some assumptions on the MS1 resolution you want to have and on the MS2 resolution you want to have, you can go through these calculations and you will end up that you can make one MS2 scan and 23, roughly 23 MS2 uh, scans. What I, what I didn't go into too much detail uh, here is that there is a certain amount of time the instrument will need to perform the scan, but there is also a certain amount of time it will need for overhead, and this is uh, something that you will need to know roughly, otherwise you will end up with a little bit of estimate. Okay, this is how the method would look like then. 
Um, that I would say that's a very typical method you could use on a Q-executive HF. Then there was an additional thing. In 2014, they improved the acquisition that you could do on the Orbitrap, and this basically gives you a twofold improvement. So if you can do the scanning and the ion accumulation in parallel, um, this, will, yeah, this will just speed up your method by a factor of two. Of course, that standard was standard for shotgun methods for a long time already, but um, that's just a change they needed to do in the acquisition software. Um, okay, and then I was before I was saying if you know what kind of resolution you want to choose for MS1 and MS2, you can make this calculation. But the question is, of course, what kind of res resolution should, should I choose? And that's not such an easy question to answer, actually. If you look at the of, of the relation of the resolution to the mass accuracy, it's a non-linear uh, relation. Here it's shown for two different instruments, and. <coughs> You can see that when you go up with the resolution to even higher and higher, uh, higher values, uh, the mass accuracy will not go up linearly with that. So there is probably some sweet spot of resolution, uh, some good trade-off. And here's just some some considerations that you can have from a theoretical side. In so in reality, we just do this practically. So we try maybe two settings, and then you can see which one is the better one. Uh, but if you would look at it from a theoretical side. Um, if you decrease your resolution on MS2, because you have complex MS2 spectra, of course, you will be less able to distinguish peaks that are close together. So that's kind of a negative thing. But also, because you want to keep your cycle time and the scans are shorter now, you can make more MS2 segments. And this will, again, decrease your uh, complexity. So that's a positive thing. And this is actually then the, the thing that gets often neglected, but it's extremely important. Uh, it can be completely... Um, unimportant if you have enough ions for your scans, but if you do not have enough ions for your scans and you are even lowering your fill times, then you will not have the optimum number of ions in your orbit trap. So these are the things that you would have to consider from a theoretical side. Uh, then at some point we were also interested in, there were these UHPLC chromatographic systems coming out and we were interested in how, how this would influence the different methods. So we were able to measure in Paolo Picotti's lab back then and compare two different chromatographies. Um, more a classical one that we were using, 30 centimeter columns, 3 micron beads, to a more modern one, 50 centimeter columns and smaller beads. And we acquired this data set described here, triplicates of shotgun and DIA. And these were the methods we were using, so we were doing exactly what I described before, changing the methods such that the data points per peak stayed roughly constant, and analyzing the data. And then what we saw is that both uh, methods, shotgun or DIA, they profited similarly from the higher peak capacity. And that's, I would say, a general, generally true. The better your chromatography, the, the better your data is going to be, of course, it's not necessarily getting more stable your chromatography if you have uh, if you have higher pressure and so on. That's something you have to decide yourself in your laboratory. Um, yeah, that's the same for the peptoprecos. And so our conclusion was peak capacity similarly influences uh, shotgun and data independent acquisition. And that's also an interesting slide. When I made this, I was really surprised. So I was trying to get as, as homogeneous data in our laboratory. <coughs> across uh, three or four years, and uh, looking at the performance with always the same sample, always the same instrument, ident identical gradient length. And what we improved over this uh, period of time was the, the instrument monitoring, so we had better ways of QCing the instrument, uh, we had better methods, we have better ways of uh, algorithms to make the spectral libraries, we have a better LC setup, of course, probably also the search engines we were using improved over time, also the acquisition method of the instrument improved over time, and the DIA data analysis improved over time, and uh, all these cumulative improvements led to a tripli um, triplication of um, quantitative data points you can acquire within the same amount of time. That's quite, I must say, it was quite impressive to see that. Okay, so now a few words about retention time. We think that's extremely important, normalized retention time. I think you already heard something from Ariel, so I will make the introduction relatively quick. But when you generate spectral libraries, I was saying before, you can, you always have the means to normalize your retention times. This is integrated in our software SpectNode. Um, you can do this from uh, search engines, Proton Discover or MaxQuant. And what it basically does is it assigns normalized retention times, IRTs, 
to each peptide in your spectral library. So it will convert always retention time to, uh, to this normalized space IRT, which is in principle comparable across laboratories and, um, yeah, and data sets. And this is from, from this paper. So you would have two fixed points. So that's just a practical way how to do it. You have peptides as fixed points, and these you assign you define IRTs for those, and, and then these are the fixed points you can use to assign IRTs for other peptides. It's a very simple principle. So it's going from retention time to IRT. But then you can also, when you do an analysis, you will do the opposite. You will go from IRT to retention time. So you would like to predict on your chromatographic system the exact retention time of your peptide. You can, of course, do this with de novo prediction, but these algorithms are not that accurate yet. So they are not as ac accurate if you just use empirical information from past experiments. That's why it's still beneficial to, to do this. So you can go, you can basically zoom into your data. Um, if you know your retention time, you have certain confidence where the peptide will elute, and this is where you're going to look for it. And then, of course, you can. We were comparing different variants of this. So, if you wouldn't do, if you wouldn't do this at all, this would be the data shown here. Then, if you would use what we call a classical IRT with a linear regression and only 11 fixed points, this is what is shown in the middle. But then, you can, of course, also increase the number of fixed points to thousands and do a local regression, and everything will get more accurate again. This is what is shown on the right here. And just recently, so this is basically the same thing shown again. Um, we have recently looked at this. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, do I need to do special spiking peptides for this, or can I use just the most abundant peptides of my samples? In principle, it doesn't matter. You can use any peptide that has IRTs assigned to. Of course, it has certain advantages if you always use the same peptides because you can use it at the same time for quality control and yeah. So. Um, so then yeah, we were looking at this again a bit more extensively, but what is shown here is basically exactly the same. We used, uh, we, you can do this in both directions, RT to IRT and then IRT to RT, what is shown here. And um, so then we were interested in, in a li slightly different aspect, which I didn't talk about yet. So um, uh, it's IRTs are not always exactly the same depending on um, the stationary phase or the mobile phase you use in your chromatography. There are slightly nonlinear effects in there, and we want to have a bit of closer look on, on those nonlinear effects. And to start with, we were what would happen if you have a different chromatograph chromatographic system, if you plot retention time versus IRT, you would see a certain scattering. And the bigger the scattering, the more diff, uh, the more um, unrelated your chromatography is to the, to the reference chromatography. And so we, sim we took a spectral library with IRTs and we simulated inaccurate IRTs by just adding a normally distributed noise to it. And so this is basically shown here on the left. So the more blue it is, the more uh, noise we added to the spectral library. And then we basically looked at the effect when we used the spectral library to analyze data. And so here on the right, it would it would mean, so this bar on the most right, would mean if you would basically not use any IRT at all. So we always make full ion trace extractions. This is the data quality you could get if you would do that. And on the, on the very left, this is our classical IRT when you do linear regression. So you can see it's a little bit better than, uh, than doing nothing at all. And if you use this so-called high precision IRT here, uh, you, you get the best results, like you would expect, right? That's not such a big surprise. Um, and then if we added this, this IRT noise, the, the results slightly degraded to, uh, to, uh, to the point where it's similar to not having IRT at all. And of course, yeah, so this is, that's not extremely surprising. So if you, if you use precision IRT as compared to linear IRT, the results are roughly 15% better. And if you wouldn't use any IRT at all, then it's roughly 25% better. But now in reality, it's of course, really interesting to know how well spectral libraries are transferable across uh, laboratories because as a matter of fact not always exactly the same chromatographic systems are used in different laboratories and that's practically irrelevant and therefore what we did is we we varied nine different experimental factors that we thought would be relevant for chromatography and this was the mobile phase stash, uh, the gradient length stationary phase temperature of the column column length flow rates and so on. 
and uh, we, we basically monitored the effect on this IRT, additional nonlinear IRT effects you get, or you could also say the IRT noise you have uh, in your analysis then afterwards. And the really interesting thing was that, um, so no, the actually not so surprising thing was that the mobile phase acid had the biggest influence. That makes kind of sense. But what was really not so expected from our side was that the gradient length had the second biggest influence on these IRT residuals. And that's, of course, highly relevant for, well, yeah, let's say that's relevant for how you generate your spectralize in your, lab, uh, in your laboratory, because based on these results, it makes sense to make the spectral libraries with the same gradient length. And we can actually, we, this is also what we do, and this is what gives us good results. Um, yeah, what was also very good to see on the other end of the graph was that different samples do not have a strong influence on the IRT. So if you look at the same peptides in different samples, um, the IRTs are almost identical, which is a very good thing. Um, there was a time when we thought this would be different, but it was basically, it was probably not so well controlled um, um, impressions of our site because it was not a controlled experiment. Also, the loading has a very small influence. Okay, so that's enough about IRT, about our software aspect note. So this software is free for academic use. It costs something for, for industry. Uh, the Atrium kit is required. So we have a kit that we sell, that we sell so you have to use this kit, but you can use the software for free if you're academic. Um, the software is free, is uh, easy to install. It's mass, spectro uh, mass spectrometer vendor neutral, and uh, it has two major annual releases. And here are just a couple of hallmarks of our last release. It's a really fast software. You can process very large experiments. I have also a slide about this. Uh, it includes functionality to generate spectral libraries from shotgun data. Um, you um, it includes automatic retention calibration, so all these things related to IRT does automatic. You don't have to worry about this. Uh, it also implements the LM profit algorithm, and um, yeah, it can basically do the whole workflow uh, pretty automatic. Um, so that's an interesting thing. This is going to be our next spectral out release, and we, we could manage to reduce the hardware requirements quite dramatically for, for Spectronaut. So I would say that it's very interesting because now, with, now you can analyze really large experiments, hundreds of runs, two-hour runs, so large files. You can basically process them overnight on a normal notebook with, five, also with eight gigabytes of RAM. So that's, of course, it's very interesting because I think it, it will enable, it will just be faster from measurement to getting high-quality results, and uh, I think that's an important thing. It's definitely important for our customers. Um, okay, then I have a couple of slides on pushing the limits. So these are not things we normally do in our laboratory, but it it's interesting for us to see where, where the development goes. And there, was, there were these um, ultra-high field orbitraps introduced uh, a couple of years ago, and now they also found their way into the Q-Executive series and also into the, of course, into the Fusion series of instruments. And these are basically smaller orbit traps. Uh, they have almost double their resolution at the same scan time. <laughs> That's a huge, a huge advantage, of course. And almost half, as a little bit more than half the scan time for almost, or half the scan time for almost identical resolution. And um, the possibilities are manifold. Of course, you can you can make better methods. Um, yeah. So as I said, the Q Executive series of instruments, Q Executive HF, contain this ultra high field orbit trap and the fusion Lumos, for instance. <coughs> and if you visualize this, so this is basically what you can do. You can double the number of precursor windows for the same scan time, or you can have double the resolution for identical number of segments. And it will just have an impact on your data quality. Okay, then we, we, we were able to, I think it was last year, yeah, or the day 2014-2015, uh, I think, we could go to Bremen and measure on a Q-Executive HF. And so we, we were interested in how the instrument performs for different gradient lengths. And here is the data, or the, here are the methods shown for one and two hour gradients. So more on the short side. Again, we use these typical human cell lines to benchmark. These are the methods that we used here. So we basically changed the number of MS2 segments, like you would expect to change the cycle time of the method. And we analyzed it with SpecNode, 
and this is how it looked like, so really impressive data. You can, you can quantify five to 6,000 proteins in, in these one or two hour runs on this instrument. So with really um, good quality. So this is the same for the peptide precursors. Um, so with a, si with a single shot, you can cover 50 to 60% of the expected protein. So it's not obvious, obviously it's not 100% clear how many proteins these cells really express or which ones of those proteins are really relevant for the cell. But one would expect that maybe in the range of 10,000 to 13,000 proteins can be, can be um, expressed in these cells. So it's really a significant proportion of the number of pro proteins that you can measure with a single shot. Uh, here are the CVs, that's also really important. Rudy was mentioning that the quality is very important, so we, we always monitor the CVs of these kind of methods. And one way of looking at this is just um, looking at the median CVs. They are in the range of 10%, a little bit higher for the short method as compared to large method. You can also look at it from, from the point of how many peptides can I uh, measure with which CV. So that's what is displayed here for the one-hour method in blue and for the two-hour method in, in uh, uh, I don't know, salmon. <laughs> um, and you can see that really a large proportion of the peptides can be, can be measured with a very low CV in the range of 0 to 20%, so the data quality is really high. Um, then something that was really striking to us, very interesting fact, is in this one-hour DIA run, we identified 45,000 precursors corresponding to almost 6,000 protein groups. And when you look at the best published shotgun run on this instrument with a similar sample, then um, there are 36,000 MS2 spectra in this run. And 20, 26,000 peptides were identified in this run. So you can basically, so you can see that more peptides can be identified than a mass spectrometer can do sequential MS2 scans in a shotgun method. And also what is, what is also very interesting is that DIA is obviously very suited to having short gradients or high throughput. And that we also want to make the link to what Rudy showed before, because the more samples you can measure or the more biological states you can measure, the more general you can also learn for this, from this data. And you can use uh, maybe even fancy uh, machine learning techniques to learn for, from your data, make predictions. And, Therefore, the throughput or the number of samples you can measure is very important, and with these kind of methods, you can go now to a really high throughput. Or you can also draw the parallels to computing, where uh, the, the trend is at the moment to go from sequential computing mode to parallel computing. Um, so here would be, for instance, a six-core processor. Um, yeah, so I think that's a very interesting development and shows still the potential of mass spectrometry. And then we were also looking at more at longer, even longer runs. And what it, we, did, we did here, we measured these uh, HeLa jerk attack, these human cell lines in triplicates. And we also additionally, we performed what we call DIA alignment. So we were even uh, using alignment algorithms to transfer identifications across the runs. And with this methodology, we could almost identify 8,000 protein groups, also really impressive, and median CVs that were really very good in the range of 10%. So if you increase the gradient length, you can even go to higher coverage. Of course, at some point, it's not a linear relationship. It will, it will flatten off. Um, OK, and this was the most recent thing we did. <laughs> there, was, there was a data set published from Matthias Matthias Mann. Um, here's the title. So it's cell type and brain region resolved mouse brain proteome. Um, it was 270 runs, roughly two months of, of measurement time on a QX-Active HF. Um, high quality data set. Um, we generated a spectral library with Spectronaut, took us roughly three hours. This doesn't include the database search, of course. Um, it, this was the spectral library that was generated or that resulted from this. Uh, 13,000 um, protein groups, because the, the, the runs were really, they, they used very nice homogeneous chromatography. We could generate really high precision IRTs also. And then, uh, because from a collaborator, we also had a sample uh, from, from mouse brain, a cerebellum sample from David Gomez, and we measured this with a four-hour gradient on our Q-Executive HF, and analyzed it with the spectral library shown before. Because, we, because they used a different mobile phase acid, the, the IRTs were not that accurate, so the median absolute delta IRTs were 1.6, the extraction window was roughly 20 minutes. And what we could identify in this sample 
um, was roughly 8,000 proteins or more than 8,000 proteins. So really impressive. And so I would, for us, that's not something that we will do right now in our laboratory. Uh, of course, we will not <laughs> acquire 270 runs for each type of sample uh, we are analyzing, but it just, it's interesting and shows the direction where the field maybe goes, or it also shows the increase of data quality over time. So the data quality was in gets increasingly better, and this also opens up different uh, possibilities for algorithms that can be used on the data. And now I have a couple of applications. So here's a customer project. So this customer had, they already have a test uh, in human blood, and they were interested in um, what are, so they, they had already a couple of markers, but they were unsure about the identi identities of those, and they wanted to use our technology to get the identi identities of those markers. And therefore, they measured two groups of uh, patients. Um, and we acquired um, HRM runs of these samples, and we, we compared and looked for statistically regulated proteins. Um, and what they found was the, really the proteins they su suspected to be the biomarkers and also new ones. And uh, from a biological point of view, it made a lot of sense what we found. Also, when we did uh, unsupervised clustering, so we basically acquired the data blinded um, when we did un unsupervised clustering, the two classes could be perfectly regenerated by the clustering, which is, of course, very nice because it shows you that the data quality is high enough to separate these two groups and you could definitely generate... Um, panels that could distinguish between, between these two groups or even subgroups very accurately if you want to. Um, and this is just an example of a biomarker found. So this would be uh, uh, maybe healthy or sick and this would be, yeah, this is class two and class one, one peptide and this protein was found with two peptides. So very nice data and our customer was very, very happy with that. Uh, here I show a second customer project was animal serum this time. And they, they performed a drug treatment of these animals. Uh, and um, then they, it was basically a time course. So they took, uh, they drawed blood uh, in several days over a course of roughly a year. year. And so they had six invi individuals in this experimental setup. And we acquired the data with our typical workflow. We could quantify roughly 500 proteins. That's a typical number for blood, I would say. Data was normalized. and. When we d again did the unsupervised clustering, what was very interesting to see is that the clustering um, clustered the samples according to day post-treatment. So on the right, it would be a higher day post-treatment, and on the left, it's right after the treatment. But it's, of course, interesting to see that. That's what you would like to see if you perform such an experiment. And then if you look at the candidates that we found, uh, we often found this kind of behavior of, of the biomarkers. So after the treatment, they went up, and then they slowly decayed again, went down. If you look at this now, of course, you would, could say, I would rather have a higher resolution in this time, and the rest is not so interesting. But that's maybe then a follow-up project for them. And here is some, some R&D project from our side that we did with this collaborator, David Gomez. Uh, it was mouse spiral cortex whisker development, and here is the experimental setup. It was um, four conditions, perinatal day, and uh, the, the brain is basically dissected out. And we had three sample preparation replicates because the, I think it was difficult to get enough material from a single mouse. Um, and then we did typical workflow, 90 minutes gradients on a, on a Q-executive HF, roughly 5,000 proteins measured. And here again, the unsupervised clustering could perfectly cluster the different conditions together. Um, and then we also, we are in the course of analyzing this data also together with our collaborator, a bit more from the biological side. What was done here by, actually by still someone at, at Biognosis, Roland Brudor, he did a C-means clustering, Go analysis. And you can definitely find a very dynamic proteome, lots of things changing. And if you look at the GO terms, it's definitely very relevant for, for uh, neuronal development. You find terms like synapse, synapse vesicles, or exon genesis. So it's definitely a very interesting data set that we will analyze now. Yeah, OK, that was it. So from a summary, I would say that q traps are very well suited to perform DIA. Um, they are also very well suited to generate spectral libraries, good instruments for performing performing shotgun. And uh, then our software spec node is powerful software for uh, for data DA or swath data analysis. Um, and in terms of quantitation, 
DA is definitely can be very comprehensive. Um, it is extremely reproducible, so you can get to an, a percentage of missing values in your matrix proteins times runs that can be a few percent. Of course, if you have large biological variants, this percent will also go up a little bit, but it's still really extremely high quality. And uh, the, the measurement is also very precise, so you typically have low CVs. Typically, for technical replicates, we have CVs, median CVs be below 10%. And you can also go to a really high throughput, what is not shown here. So you can have really high throughput and measure hundreds or thousands of samples, which is very interesting. Okay, with this, I would like to close and thank the, here the diagnosis team on the left and Yuk Swan from Thermo, uh, Lin Yang Cheng, and Olga Wittek from Purdue. They helped us with, with this uh, comparison of shotgun and DIA. Then Paula Picocchi's lab from ETH and David Gomez. And thank you for your attention. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask or... Oh. So Lucas, so can you comment? Um, so does it look like DIA will completely do away with uh, uh, data dependent acquisition? I mean, do you see it on the way out? Okay, so yeah, that's of course an interesting question. Um, it is definitely the case that the proteomics communities um, they, they are quick in trying out new things, but your established workflow you will not just throw away like this uh, within a month just because someone showed something. So because uh, it's just yeah, once you have an established workflow, that's that's a lot. That's a worth a lot, right? But I think uh, with time, more and more people will will switch to DIH for these type of analysis just because the data quality is much better, and also the the whole pipeline gets much easier. So it is known now what methods are good. Um, the software gets better and better, and so it's much easier to acquire a new workflow now. So I think um, we can also see that there's a trend that this is more and more done instead of shotgun. And then, of course, for library generation, shotgun is at the moment crucial. So without shotgun, you couldn't generate the libraries. Um, but also there, yeah, there are trends that you don't even need shotgun to analyze DIA data. This DIA umpire, for instance, can can live without shotgun at all. So. So it's also an interesting development. I would like to ask, uh, can Spectronaut analyze uh, fractionated DIA runs? Yeah, it can also do that, yeah. So what and how does it work? So what it will basically do is, um, you can, if you want to, you can uh, have fraction-specific spectral library. Makes sense. It will your make your data quality a little bit better. And it will then perform the normalization in each fraction separately. Um, and then it will basically, for the statistical testing, it will not change so much. So if you look, if we perform t-tests for protein groups, and we just take all the data points across the two conditions and replicates for this protein group, and if a peptide happens to be measured in two fractions, the data points will, but there will be just more than, uh, let's say, six data points if you have three replicates in two conditions, then you have maybe 12 data points for this peptide and they will all be treated separately. So that's not an issue for data analysis. You can basically use the same principles there. Of course, it gets a bit more complicated if you want to use um, more advanced statistical models like ANOVA models or uh, then it's a little bit of a different story. And uh, another question would be, have you tried to look uh, what's the variation of your quantitative measurements if you plot them uh, against abundance of the proteins? Uh, yeah, of course we looked at that too. You can see a strong relation as you can see in any, uh, no matter whether you do SRM, shotgun or DIA. So there's, <coughs> there's a strong relation between the CVs and the abundance of protein. But so we also did this a bit more thorough analysis in this comparison of shotgun and DIA. We could see that DIA outperformed shotgun in all abundance classes. So the pre precision was always better or similar as compared to shotgun. Uh, 
uh, Lucas, very impressive talk. So can you describe a bit how you summarize from the transition level intensity to your final protein table? Do you have some specific considerations? Um, you mean how we, how we make protein quantities in the end? Yes. So usually we do it very simple, we just sum up for the protein. Um, but uh, I think in relation as to this work that has been recently done, where uh, these different software packages were compa uh, compared, <coughs> our bioinformatician Oli also came up with different ways how you can generate protein quantities. But I, I must say, we are not using the protein quantities directly so much ourselves, so that's why it's not so important. We, are, we mostly use it for these heat maps, so just for visualization purposes. But we don't, we don't use this data matrix to put it into some statistical uh, analysis. So for the statistical analysis, we always perform it on the peptide precursor level. So it, we take the quantities of the peptide precursor and not the protein quantities. That's why we didn't spend too much time on optimizing how to make protein quantities, because it's not so relevant in the end for our analysis pipeline. Two small questions. Uh, the DIA windows for the acquisition, they seemed of a similar width or similar size across the whole M over Z. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the low M over Z, there are more precursors. High, there are less. Do you adjust them a bit or plan to adjust them a bit or would it improve anything? Yeah, typically we do variable windows. So we adjust the window size according to precursor density. And the second one is those high numbers of proteins, peptides, and so on. This comes after proper, I don't know what proper is, but FDR at the PSM level, peptide level, at the protein level. So for the data, yeah, that's a good question. So for the DIA analysis, we typically do, uh, you could say, PSM, FDR only. But because in most applications, we have a spectral library recovery of more than 90%. Uh, it's, we didn't have to break our head yet how you control for the protein FDR because if you already cover almost all of your spectral library, then your protein FDR cannot be inflated so much. So, but of course you could also control for protein FDR. It's definitely a good thing to do that as well. So we do it always for the spectral library generation, but we don't do it at the moment for the DIA anal analysis just because we think it's not so relevant at the moment. But when you do these larger libraries, with more proteins and with lower recoveries from the spectral library, then it definitely becomes relevant to also control the protein FDR. Okay, thank you very much, Lucas. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.